book of Acts. This has been a wonderful series we've been in and such a blessing to be in Acts. I've always loved the book of Acts. I've always, um, you know, and it's, it's, it, it's wonderful to see the history of the church. You know, we know that the church started in Christ's earthly ministry and um, there the Lord commissioned his kind of church and he gave us the promise to his kind of church that the gates of hell should not prevail against it and that his kind of church would be here when he returned to the earth. And he also promised the church that he would be with them always, even until the end of the age. And so it's refreshing to see from Acts the Paul's first, second, and third missionary journey and getting some clarity and some references and perspective of where that fits in with the epistles that he writes too. I think that's good. I think that's good that we can kind of compare and contrast. You know, well, we're here and the, even though he's writing uh, Thessalonians, well, he may be in a situation in Acts while he's writing Thessalonians. And so I think it's neat to put those two things together. Uh, you know, the three missionary journeys and then his journey to Rome, his final journey to Rome where he was executed. But in chapter 13 of Acts, we are in a transition chapter. Really, it kind of it sits in the middle of Acts. I mean, there's 28 chapters, so it's almost in the middle of Acts. But right in the middle, we see a transition. But before, first, you know, chapters 1 through 12, we mainly saw... Peter and the Jerusalem church, the Jerusalem Christians. We saw the day of Pentecost. We saw that they had obeyed the Lord's command when he said to be a witness unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the outermost part of the earth. And so we see that the church just keeps continuing to grow as God saves. We see the pattern which the church grows as the Lord saves them first, and then they're added through baptism, through scriptural baptism, and then, so we see that they're saved, and then we see a servant, a servant to, uh, that comes out of the heart of those who are saved. You know, the Lord just doesn't save us just to, to sit here and, and wait for him to come back, you know. Uh, he puts a heart within us to serve him, to bring him glory, uh, to be an example, to be a testimony, to do everything we do to the glory of God so others can see uh, that we, you know, are Christian and we worship the Lord. And so we certainly see this in Acts, in this early church. And so really we saw you know, the ministry of Philip there some, to Samaria. We saw Peter. We saw you know, James and, and everything. And, but in chapter 13, we really start with the ministry of Paul. And there Paul kind of goes to the rest or the end of Acts. Now if you think about it, and the reason why was we know the author of Luke or author of Acts is Luke and Luke was a travel companion of Paul and so we really do get a you know a first person or you know a narrative there uh, an actual experience which Luke had with Paul but we know that the scriptures are all inspired and they're God breathed so even you know if Luke was recalling an incident the Holy Spirit had him recall it perfectly without error so we know that the entire scriptures from the beginning to the end are without error. They're God-breathed. We can trust them and that um, they do not contradict one another. One of the things that we talked about last week in Acts chapter 13 is uh, we started, we didn't get really too far. I think we got to verse 5. We really, at, if you look at verse 1, there were five leaders at the church of Antioch. And so if you remember how the church of Antioch really kind of got started was there, you know, they had a revival breakout and the church of Jerusalem heard about it and then so they sent up Barnabas from the church of Jerusalem and then when Barnabas got to Antioch, you know, he encouraged the saints. He encouraged them all and then he went to Tarsus to go get Saul. And so he brought Saul down to Antioch and then we see really the leadership grow within Antioch. I mean, you had five leaders there in chapter 13, verse 1. And so we see that this church becomes the beacon for missions uh, to the Gentile world. 
You know, I mean, we also, we do know that we have the Jerusalem church down south in Jerusalem, but up north and near Syria, you've got Antioch, which is kind of near Turkey, which is kind of where near Paul was going, you know, Ephesus and Galatians and Thessalonica, and all of that is up there near Syria where there's Turkey and Philippi. And so we see that this church of Antioch was kind of a launch pad for missions. And so many times when we start talking about missions, it is important that even with missions, the way we send out missionaries, we do it biblically. You know, because we see it done. We see a blueprint of how mission work is to be done. That we see that the church of Antioch sent out Paul and Barnabas. And uh, verse 2, it says, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I called them. In verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they, the church, sent them, who? Paul and Barnabas, away. So it wasn't, you know, the Holy Spirit just convicting Paul and Barnabas in secret one night saying, hey, I, I, I need you guys to leave and just go ahead and go. No, he had the church lay hands on them, and then the church sent the missionaries. And that's the way we send missionaries today, or we should. You know, every missionary that's out in the field should have a main sending church. And we know that other churches can support the missionaries, but they need to go uh, with a sending church so that way they can have authority. They can have the authority to baptize. And when they baptize, when, like, you're in a mission, I don't know if you all have ever been in a mission work before, been a member of a mission work. I know, I know um, Muddy Ford turned into Jordan, but I don't know by the time Pastor Tony got there if it was already mission. It might have been out of Jordan, out of Florida. Um, But when he would baptize, he was baptizing under the authority of the sending church, uh, whoever that main sending church was. So uh, if if we were to send someone out to start a church, it doesn't matter where it's at. It could be down the street, or it could be in Peru. It could be in Ecuador. Who knows? When they, until they can become their own established church and their own independent body and they're recognized and they have an organizational service, they're recognized as an independent, autonomous uh, body of baptized believers, then they need to do it under the sending church's authority. So in that way, we see a lot of places get missionaries wrong because you have seminaries that send missionaries and you have schools and you have organizations and you have committees how, how can a committee give the authority to a missionary to baptize? They can't. Only one of the Lord's churches has the authority because only Jesus gave the authority to his church. And so really, uh, just in chapter 13, <laughs> we have surmised that. We see the, the blueprint of mission work. And so really, where we're picking up is verse 6, and we're going to go to verse 13. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the, the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O fool of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, thou wilt not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here tonight. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your gift of calling us to this church where we know that sound doctrine is preached and taught and studied and father that's a gift we know that's a a gift of your grace and father we thank you lord 
We thank you that we can come together tonight and we can love one another. We can worship you together. We do our hearts all uh, go up and Father, in prayer for those, Lord, who are afflicted and suffering, those who are in our hearts whom we love. Father, we know you're in control of all things and you have the power to heal. Father, we know you have the power to give them comfort and encouragement and hope. And Father, we thank you for all of those because we know that you will, for you promise that you will. And Father, you never disappoint. You're faithful. Thank you, Lord. Lord, may we just open up your word now and look at your word and be faithful and true to the teaching. May the Spirit guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we talk about, if we go back and talk about the overall points that we're seeing, I gave them to you last week. The, we saw that this church was a spiritual church, the church of Antioch. We see that it was an effective church. It was a strong church. We see many, you know, the work of God being published through this church of Antioch. With some characteristics of this church is we see that it had spiritual leaders in verse 1 that we saw, those five leaders. So we know that they were receiving sound doctrine. This church had spiritual leaders first. Then we see the spiritual missions that they were sent out on in verse 2 through 5. We're going to pick up now where... It's verses 6 through 8, and then we're going to look at verse 13 as part of this third point. But we see that them come upon spiritual opposition. Anytime you're doing the work of the Lord and you're seeking to share the gospel, Satan will always be there to attack. He'll always be there to attack God's work. Whether it's externally, whether it's internally, you're talking about subtlety, the devil is subtle. He's a deceiver, he, and he's a liar and the father of it. And so he'll even have you so worried and this about this and that and the other. I'm telling you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if, uh, you know, he's even whispering in some people's ears that don't go anywhere because of COVID. Don't go back to church because of COVID. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Now, I'm not... I'm not insensitive to those who have an actual, really medical condition where you know they they are susceptible to it. I don't want to act like I'm callous like that, but don't let Dave, don't let Satan deceive you. We we need to stop and think about our decisions. What what is this is this faith, or do I have a real concern for my medical situation, or is do I have an issue with faith, or is the devil deceiving me? I'm just saying he's slippery. He could deceive you any way, anyhow. And uh, don't underestimate them. But so anytime we go out and we try to spread the gospel or the word of God or try to be a good testimony, the Satan will oppose you. And so lastly, verses 9 through 12, we see spiritual victory. So first of all, like I said, when, people's, when God's people seek to advance God's kingdom on earth in any way, Satan will oppose. And that's what we see here in verses 6 through 8. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now this place in Paphos, now if you remember that Barnabas and Paul are now out on their first missionary journey. And we saw that from the first six verses uh, there in Acts. And so this place, Paphos, was not only the seat of the Roman Empire, but was a great center for the worship of Aphrodite, Venus, the greatest festival in Cyprus in honor. Now, this festival that they had in honor of Aphrodite was Aphrodisia. This festival, Aphrodisia, was held for three days each spring. It was attended by large crowds, not only from parts of Cyprus, but from surrounding countries. This, it was a very large city. It was full of immorality. The, it had extensive religious prostitution, which accompanied Aphrodisia festival. Religious prostitution. And it also, now, what happened to Paphos? It fell by frequent earthquakes. And now this city is in ruins. And there's nothing there. 
So that's interesting. This city has now had all those frequent earthquakes. But let's look at this person, Bar-Jesus. So we see in Paphos, Paul and Barnabas found this sorcerer, a magician, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, Bar-Jesus was a Jewish practitioner of magic and the occult, but was mainly a deceiver who put his knowledge to evil use. Luke calls him a false prophet. Ironically, Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus, or son of salvation. Jesus means salvation. So, like Bar, it's that prefix Bar, uh, Barnabas, is son of encouragement. Simon Bar-Jonah was Simon, son of Jonah. And so this Bar-Jesus is son of Jesus. And so his name is ironic here, considering that he is a false prophet, and he's a sorcerer, and he is going about deceiving everyone. And here it says that Bar-Jesus, in verse 7, was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. Now, that word prudent means that he was intelligent. He was learned. And, you know, being in that Greek culture, that certainly where you had philosophy and philosophers and the art of intelligence, he called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So, certainly this bar Jesus, this false prophet, was in his entourage. It was in his, his group. And there, who knows what kind of false religion that he was spinning on Sergius. But when Sergius saw Paul and Barnabas, he, he beckoned them over to hear the word of God. Now, verse 8 starts the spiritual opposition. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, that means Bar-Jesus, Bar now, I wanted to kind of read this. Luke's note here, it does not mean that Bar-Jesus is translated to Elymas. Elymas is a Greek word. It's a Greek transl transliteration of an Arabic word for magician. So he was known for this name by his Greek name. So Elymas was Bar-Jesus' Greek name. Bar-Jesus was his Jewish name. And that kind of come in... in uh, to play here when we, when we see Paul uh, or Saul mentioned as Paul. But look at what happens. He withstood them. So we see spiritual opposition right here. And what did he do? Seeking to turn away the deputy, Sergius, Paulus, from the faith. He withstood them. Saul and Barnabas just as James and Jambres, the magicians of Egypt, withstood Moses, he did all he could to do to prevent Sergius from hearing the gospel from Paul and Barnabas. He withstood them. He did not want him to hear the gospel. He did not want him to hear the Lord's word. And who knows what this man, what kind of deceit, this man, this false prophet had. I mean, being a sorcerer, a magician, or whatever, he's in the occult, and he's in all these things. Turn with me, keep your hands here, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, here's the point I want to say, and then keep going. And... It's too bad I can't see my daughter's heads because this is kind of to all the, the, the young people that truth does matter and there are a lot of false teachers out there. There's a lot of people. You know what, is, you know, you know what the worst truth is or the worst lie is a half truth. That's the worst lie is when it's believable enough what they're saying is true and they're false. They're deceivers. And they go about, you need to find and look for, throughout your whole life where it's, it is sound doctrine, sound truth, the word of God. Because we see that this Sergius person was not saved. 
having a false prophet and a false teacher with him, accompanied with him all the time. And so look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Paul talks about this. Now this is Paul writing, and you know, I'm just imagining as we're getting ready to watch Paul have straight conflict with Bar Jesus, that as Paul's writing this, he must have met all kinds of false prophets. He, Paul must have met all kinds of false teachers that we don't even read about. And so he writes about them here. And we got to be on our guard. You have to be on your guard. What false teachers and preachers are spinning out there. Now he says in chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, who withstood Paul and Barnabas? Bar Jesus withstood them, right? Well, so just as these two people withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Actually, look at chapter, look, look at verse 1 for context. He's talking about men we haven't read about. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despiser of those who are, that are good, traitors, uh, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. You would have thought he was describing the most uh, awful person on earth and who's in prison and, you know, selling crack. He's talking about people who have a form of godliness here. He's not talking about the worst pr prisoners on earth. All of these things that we just said, he says, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such. Turn away. Turn away from them. If you get a hint at all of, of these characteristics from these people that claim to be godly, that claim to be bringing you the truth, that claim to be preaching and teaching unto you the truth, turn away. Now, we're all sinners saved by grace, but he's talking about people who enjoy these things. That's what he said. They're pleasures, they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And that's not right. Especially coming from someone who has an authority, who claims to have an authority. And that's what, who he's talking about in verse 6. Uh, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leap captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, you know, we, we see this all the time. You, have a, you, you know, sometimes we dismiss things like this because we always think of the, the most extreme cases like TV evangelists. It includes them, but let's, not, but let's still be on our guard. You know, I mean, yeah, it, to me, hopefully to you, it's pretty obvious, these TV evangelists who are getting caught in these sex schemes and cults and stuff like that, well, that, I mean, that was pretty obvious to begin with. I mean, we know that as God's people, uh, that, you know, you're not going to have a crowd of 50,000 people in preaching the truth at the same time. You, you, people just won't do that. Narrow is the way which leads to salvation. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. You know, uh, God has a remnant according to election. We don't typically see mega churches that are preaching sound truth. And if we are, and this is where Dad... Well, I'm, I'm not going to say it because, because we're, we're going to get published. Dad got upset with Ashton Avenue because instead of going out and starting more churches, they started having multiple services during the day to accompany the crowd. That's, I, I remember that, and I still remember that to this day. That if, if our crowd gets too big for one pastor to sit all at one time, all at the same time. Now, look, that's what a church is. That's what a church body is. It's a local assembly, and Paul compares you to body parts. And what do body parts do? They all meet at the same time 
at the same place, in the same location. You know, and we can't be a body of Christ if my arm's showing up at 7 a.m. and my foot showing up at 10 a.m. You know, it, you cannot be a whole assembled body of believers and have your body separated between times. And so really, that is, so if you get to the point where you're too big for one pastor, start more churches. You know, thin your herd with more churches. Uh, go out. At that time, if, if, if you really do have a congregation that massive, you're probably getting people from different counties. You know, who can, uh, we can start up a church in Madison County. We can start up a church in Georgetown. By then, if you have, I mean, I don't know how much, I don't know how much we hold here, maybe 300. Do you know, Brother Benny? 300, maybe, maybe more. I mean, if we're packing 500 people in here and people are having to stand outside, we probably have men in here who are preachers, who are called to the word, uh, you know, who are called to preach, and they can go out and, and start up a mission, send them out as missionaries. Anyway, I'm digressing, but, it, you know, it, I think it's healthy for us to understand church truth. I really do. And, you know, we see that uh, these churches nowadays... Uh, that, that always kind of was a little pet peeve of mine uh, to have two services in the morning because you're not, you're, you're not assembling as one body. You're not a local assembly of body, or a body of believers at that point uh, if, you're, if you split your church service into two. But anyway, I, I digress. But, but look at this. They said, and he says in verse seven, "I'm still in, in third, and I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter three, verse seven. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men." as theirs also was. When we're getting ready to see what Paul does to bar Jesus, this verse is going to make a little bit of sense. Instantly, bar Jesus becomes manifest to all as a deceiver. In verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which come unto me at Antioch at Iconium and Lystra with what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord delivered me so here's the thing is you know as, really this could be a good like a, a good youth uh, message to those who are out there and um, you know they're not had not been settled and seasoned and and nurtured in the the, the word the sound doctrine as long as, as some of uh, the other ones here have you know, they still have those minds. Um, we need to ever be giving them the importance and ever teaching them the importance of staying under sound doctrine. And that's what Timothy is charging, or I'm sorry, Paul is charging Timothy. Consider those who have the form of godliness but are lovers of pleasure more than God. Look at their characteristics. Now look at what my characteristic is. Look at the doctrine which we're preaching Consider this doctrine. Consider what Paul went through for this doctrine. Now compare the two. And that should give you a very clear indication of who the false ones are and who the true teachers and preachers are of God, the ones who stay with sound doctrine, whether it's popular or it's not. That's the thing. You know, I know uh, the, the, the flesh side you know, love to see 200 people here, wouldn't you? I mean, um, at the flesh side, wouldn't you love to build a gymnasium and have basketball goals and have a softball team? And I've been wanting to get on a softball team forever, but now, now I'm afraid I'd die running down the first base. But I think it's too late for me. But some of you, it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, but that flesh wants it. But I, you know what? If they all come pouring in and that means that I have to compromise the truth and preach and, and not preach an unpopular topic, then 
then who am I helping? And I'm making God angry. And we're about to see something that makes God very, very angry. We see an example of anger more with false teachers and false prophets in the word of God than anybody. Jesus wasn't angry at the prostitutes. You know, he was out, he was seeking to save those who were lost. He had compassion upon sinners. He ate with sinners. He dined with sinners. But buddy, if you were a false teacher or a false preacher or you were out to deceive or being deceived yourself, remember he made that whip and he went in and he went in the money changers and we see Paul, uh, he's not lovey-dovey with bar Jesus here. He's, he's, not, he's not outstretched in love. He's, he's getting bar Jesus down the road. We saw that with Peter. We see that and with Paul, with, uh, he says if any, if anybody comes preaching another type of gospel that is not the same gospel which I preach to you, even if it were an angel who came down from heaven, like imagine right now an angel comes down and we're like, what? And, they, and he starts saying that Jesus never did raise from the dead. Let them be accursed. Let that angel be accursed. I believe the word of God more than I would an angel that came down from heaven or up from hell in that case, you know. Let them be an anthema. That's what Paul says. If you have been taught any other doctrine, any other gospel, let them be accursed. Um, we see spiritual opposition. We see Satan behind spiritual opposition. The lesson is, is know that when we share the gospel to someone, Satan will use any means in any way to battle you. Here was an, an external attack, which Paul, if you flip back to Acts chapter 13, um, we may go back to Acts, or to 2 Timothy chapter 4, so if, if you did keep your finger there or have a bookmark there, we, we may go back. We may not, may not have time. But here's the thing with this spiritual opposition. This was an external attack. Bar-Jesus withstood Paul and Barnabas. But Satan also uses strategy of attack within the church, not just outside of the church, but he goes to attack inside of the churches as well. If Satan get church members attacking one another, he has successfully ruined testimonies and he has stopped the forward progress of sharing the gospel. If we're all in here attacking one another, we're not focused on outreach. We're focused on attacking one another. And we've ruined our own testimony because those attacks don't end very well. This will get brought out or that will get brought out. I mean, uh, we, I mean, it wasn't a big, uh, you know, ruckus, but we had a little bit of a ruckus. And it, it always seemed like it got worse near camp time because we hosted camp and then people inside the, the church or, or whatever, um, you know, you know what would end up happening. We, we have some camp people in here. Sometimes you get people who only want to go to camp who start showing up all of a sudden and hadn't been showing up the rest of the year who have a little bit more fleshly, worldly, characteristic attitude lifestyle and then they start multiplying. And then soon they're outnumbering the, the people who have been here the whole time. And so then you start having votes over and that's why church discipline is important. That's why, you know, uh, saving, or I mean, I'm sorry, baptizing only those who truly believe is important. I mean, sometimes you don't know right away. But that, that's the thing, is um, we see that attack that Satan uses within the churches. And then Brother Chapman talks about the church splitting a couple times. Uh, where he, I don't know if you've only been to one place that happened or more than one, but... Um, that's something. The pastor walk right out and take a third of the people with them, and um, we see it all the time. Satan will attack within. And as a matter of fact, we see an example of this in verse 13, don't we, with John Mark. It happens to the best of us. We must always be on our guard. I mean, let's never think we're above lashing out in the flesh. You know, we must always be on our guard of Satan's attacks. 
In verse 13, it says, Now when Paul and his company, now don't, now don't worry, we're going to come back where we were, but this is part of the spiritual opposition point uh, in verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Pergia, or Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now that departing from them, now this is interesting. That word departing means he left. He left. Now, when we look at Acts chapter 15, where Paul talks about it, uh, my pages are sticking together. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36, So this was after the first missionary journey and they're getting ready to gear up to go on the second missionary journey. And so in verse 36 of chapter 15, and some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed. Did you see that word departed again? That's a different word than the one used in Luke. This one has more of a desertion. We're not really sure why Mark left, but we know that Paul did not think it was okay. Whatever reason John Mark had to leave, he left their company. This word right here Paul is using, or Luke is using, departed as a desert, or deserted them. And so from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. In verse 39, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren into the grace of God. Now we know this was the sovereign will of God, but we see that there's contention here. And this is another way Satan will attack, and he will attack the best of us. I mean, he had, we see it right here that there was a sharp... I mean, uh, Paul, you know, the Paul and Barnabas duo is done. <laughs> you know, they had to split up over this issue with John Mark. Now, John Mark was cousins with Barnabas. And so that could... I mean, at this point, we're guessing why John Mark left. There's a lot of guesses out there. And if you read commentaries, there's 10 reasons why John Mark might have left from malaria all the way to... He didn't like the way Paul was taking over uh, and telling Barnabas what to do, his, his uncle, Barn, or uncle Barnabas. And so, I mean, you see one reason or the other. Whatever that reason was is, is Paul did not think it was good enough to take him the second time. Internal dissension, division, and disunity, they continue to disrupt the works of God that have stood for fast against external persecution. We see the trail of blood. We see that Nero tried to kill him. Rome tried to kill him. Queen Elizabeth tried to kill him. Bloody Mary tried to kill him. I mean, uh, the Pope tried to kill him. Everybody's trying to kill the Christians, and they're not succeeding. We're seeing actually Christianity go stronger and have more resolve. But the attacks within the church, those are the ones that are the most devastating. It hurts our testimony. I mean, the Satan doesn't have to. He just sits back and watches us fight each other and accomplish his, you know, the same thing. I, I, I want to really get to Paul. Now, here in verse 9, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry up. I want to get to verse 13. Then Saul, in verse 9, who also is called Paul. This is the first time he's called Paul. This is the first time we see him called Paul. Now, now here's... Here, here's a couple reasons, and this still isn't clear, but the majority of people believe this is the way it is. His Jewish name is Saul. So he grew up with mom and dad calling him Saul. His Gentile name is Paul. His Greek name is Paul. And so now we see that he's going out to the Gentiles and to the Greeks that he's now starting to be called Paul. And now we're, he's not into, you know, that, that whole Jewish I identification anymore of going out and preaching the word, even though he himself is a Jew, you know. But we see Luke start using the verbiage Paul, and even Paul himself. 
when he's preaching or when he's writing to Gentile churches and Greek churches, he's using his Greek name, his Roman name. His, so he is still, you know, Saul of Tarsus, but we see that his uh, Greek and Gentile name is Paul. But look at this. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and set his eyes on him. He set his eyes upon Bar Jesus. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, this, you know, isn't our normal being filled with the Holy Ghost like we're charged to be. You know, we're, we're charged to be, be being filled with the Holy Ghost, you know. Uh, do not quench the Holy Spirit. This is more of the special gifts of the Holy Spirit, the special gifts of miracle signs and wonders. We saw the same thing that Peter was able to penetrate the soul of Simon Magus in Samaria. And here Paul is penetrating the soul. He set his gaze upon Bar Jesus, him being filled with the Holy Ghost. And the next thing out of his mouth was that love and, you know, uh, just real being real, you know, careful and sincere and I love you. And what does he do? He lays it on Bar Jesus hard. Now, there is an aspect of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit is love. It's all of those things. But when it comes to false teachers and preachers and prophets, again, we see a different element, a different atmosphere, a, a whole different layer just come out of the Scriptures. There's a righteous rage that happens here. In verse 10, he and said, O full of all subtility and all mischief. Now that word subtility, in the Greek it means guile, deceit, craftiness. The Greeks use this word to mean a snare, a trap, uh, a deception. He says, all, full of subtility. You're full of snares and deception and all mischief. And this word mischief, believe it or not, this is the only time the Greek word is used here. Now, we see the word mischief in the English in a lot of places. But in the Greek, this is the only time this word is used here. And it's interesting. It means ease of doing. So Bar Jesus could have easily done right or he could have easily done wrong. It did not seem to sway Bar Jesus either way. Isn't that something? Full of mischief. Full of just, it's just as easy for you to sin or it's just as easy for you to do what's right. It do, doesn't matter either way. He's not convicted either way. And he said he's full of that. And he says, uh, thou child of the devil. Isn't that something that bar Jesus' name means son of Jesus? Here Paul calls him son of the devil. You're bar devil. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're bar Satan, really. You are the, uh, the child of the devil. And that's what even Jesus had. had you remember, Jesus has had strong language. He's a generation of vipers and hypocrites and woe unto you, these false teachers. And, uh, you know, so bar Jesus had this ease of doing evil by deceiving people and by trying to turn away the true messengers of God with the true gospel of God from Sergius. He says the child of the devil, uh, bar Jesus, his character was, he was full of all craftiness and deception which came at ease for him. His father, the devil, and the sad part is, is the devil is probably the one deceiving bar Jesus himself, thinking what he's doing is godly. His ambition, bar Jesus, was, he was an enemy of all righteousness. Remember, you can be an enemy of righteousness just by not being a lover of righteousness. Do you know that? You don't have to have a, a straight up hate for righteousness to be a hater of it. You can be a hater of righteousness by simply not having a love for it. And that convicts me. But we do know that the child of God that does not have that carnal mind anymore, that's enmity against God. He says in verse 10, Thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. You know, that right there is the Lord's mercy, that he didn't take him, he didn't kill him right there. 
That was the Lord's mercy. And honestly, and that's what I was going to say, we could turn there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul charges Timothy to stay instant, in season, out season, to preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Paul's doing some hard rebuking here. And we pray that it was for his good, for bar Jesus' good, because look what happened. I mean, immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking what? Some to lead him by the hand. What a, what a, a, a visual. Think about that visual. Here, here's this man who claimed to be a leader, a guide, and now he is being struck by the true God, blind and cannot see because there's a mist and a darkness about him. And um, I didn't get to all of the, 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 the cool things I wanted to talk about. I, I may talk a little bit about it next time and recap. But we need to understand the, the, the spiritual victory here it is in verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Not so much the miracle of the Lord, but the doctrine of the Lord. How does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing, by hearing the word of God. That, that Paul and Barnabas preached to him the word. That deputy there is Sergius, Paulus. And so we see that the, there was a spiritual victory. Not only was there a victory by Paul and Barnabas, how they had detected, they had identified this false prophet, they had identified this false teacher, but they had... Uh, confronted him straight on and so they then they were able to deliver the message and so many times we see satan's attacks devour or discourage the child of god they don't have a spiritual victory but here we know that we can have that spiritual victory it was a spiritual victory that paul and barnabas got to, to share the word and it was a spiritual victory for sergius paulus who had been deceived all these who knows how many years by this false prophet, but now was saved. He believed. He believed the word of the Lord. He believed the gospel, the plain gospel, and it was by God's power, God's power on the salvation that saved Sergius. And that day he was saved. And that day, if he were to die, he'd live forever in heaven. And that's where I assume he is today, if he, unless he's still alive somewhere. <laughs> Either he's alive or he's in heaven, one or the other. So we know that, that he is saved. He's in heaven. Let's all stand, please, and let's have an invitation. And Brother Chapman, if you'd please come. Mm -hmm.